save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia.
A reading from Revelation. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice, saying, Praise our God, all his servants, you his servants, and all who fear him, small and great. Then I heard a voice that seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of many thunder peals crying out. Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that, I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here ends the reading.
A reading from the Gospel of St. John. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He who, on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Here ends the reading. Today we mark Trinity Sunday, and it is a day when your priest or your pastor is to, supposed to explain the unexplainable, to unexplain our Trinitarian understanding of who God is. And this is sort of a difficult task because it's so murky. And as a rule, we don't like to be in the dark with things. Since the 17th and 18th century, our Western European Enlightenment cultures wants to know what is going on around us. We want it explained on a rational basis, on a scientific basis, on a way that we can understand things. We have this desire to know what's going on. And the longer we go at things, the deeper our understanding of the created universe is. As we stare into the stars of the heaven, and as we peer into the subatomic world. But still, we want to know who God is and how to understand God. Sometimes we relegate that to the realm of theologians. And quite frankly, sometimes I think theologians are a pain in the neck because what they try to do is systematize something that we can't understand. They try to systematize the mysterious. They try to systematize something that is beyond our understanding and that's not all bad because sometimes we need a metaphor in which to hang our understanding of things on we want a model in which to help us understand those things which are beyond our thinking saint anselm in the 11th century defined god 
as that which is greater, uh, that is nothing, God is that which is nothing greater than that can, that, that can, which can be conceived. I'm going to say that again. God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Every time that we think we have an idea of who God is or what God does, it goes beyond the next level. It goes out one more concentric ring of understanding, going out ahead of our ability to understand that. And quite frankly, I, for me, I think, for me, it suffices to say that God is a mystery. We peer into the realm of God every once in a while. We get a glimpse of what, who, who or what we think God is. But God is a mystery. And mystery is sort of antithetical to our understanding of the world. I think sometimes we confuse mystery with confusion. We see mystery and confusion as something that confounds our way of thinking. But I think that mystery, mystery is our ability to be humble. Humble enough to understand that we just don't have the ability to understand everything and that that's okay. It really truly is. For years and years, I hated doing jigsaw puzzles. My family did jigsaw puzzles out at the lake all the time. And when I saw that box came out, I would flee because I didn't like sitting at that table for hours and hours and hours, putting those little pieces together into a picture that sort of develops over time. But I, as I become older, I have sort of come to enjoy doing puzzles. I enjoy the solace of slowly putting one piece and another piece and another piece together to come to a bigger understanding, to see the bigger picture that is trying to be formed and to know that that takes time and it takes patience in order to do that. So when I think of Trinity Sunday, I like to think of God sometimes in terms of a jigsaw puzzle that we slowly put together over the course of our lives and we sort of understand God on a piece by piece by piece basis. In the very beginning of the Bible, we see one piece of God in the creation story. We see God as the great creator. We hear that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and they were formless and empty and dark. But the Spirit of God hovered over the earth and brought all things into being. So that's one nature of God, God as creator. And further in that story, in about 25 verses, we hear that as God created the heavens and the earth and the animals and the fish and the sea and the stars and the moon and sun, at every step, God said, it is good. And finally, God created humanity. And God said that it was good. And so when we remember that we reflect that image and likeness of, of God back out into the world, essentially we are good. We're tainted by sin, but at our being, we are good, and God sees that and loves us for that. In Matthew's gospel, at the very end of it, we see God as more of a missional sort of God. The Great Commission, we hear we hear Jesus saying, go out and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that all authority has been given to me and I give them to you. And I want you to go out and teach and make disciples of all nations. And remember that I am with you to the end of the age. Now I think maybe the disciples must have been thinking, holy smokes. First we were together with this guy. And he taught us, and he showed us miracles. And we walked with him and learned from him, and we loved him, and he loved us. And then he was nailed to a cross, and we lived in this state of great disappointment. And then all of a sudden, he's back, and he's telling us what to do. And then the very last thing he does is talks about this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What is that all about? That was a new teaching, and Jesus gave it as he was on his way back up into the heavens. And I have to think the disciples might have been scratching their heads when they heard about that. But I think that is another way of looking at God. 
that God gives us a task, God gives us a mission, and God said, as you walk through your life, there will be more about me that you will figure out. Don't worry about it right now. Take it on faith, embrace the mystery, but go out into the world and preach the gospel. And the baptism of Jesus in the story that we hear is one of those places where we hear about God and God's fullness. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all came in one place at one time. The God, the voice of God coming down from heaven saying, this is my beloved. Listen to him. The dove coming down upon Jesus symbolizing the Holy Spirit. And there's Jesus in the River Jordan during his baptism. And I think that's one piece that I would like to look at as we sort of explore the nature of God. From Matthew's Gospel, God sends us out to baptize, and Jesus is baptized at the beginning of his ministry. He does this and sets an example for us to follow. A few nights ago on the Dean's Forum, we talked about baptism. And we reminded ourselves about what baptism is all about as Christians. There's a theological understanding about baptism, and during the baptismal rite, we express that when we say the Apostles' Creed. And we come to a certain understanding of what we're supposed to be as baptized people, and it's very clear. And it's very explicit. We are con to continue in the Disciples' Fellowship, and the prayers and the breaking of bread. And the prayers that we do right now as we pray the daily office, which goes on continually around the world constantly. And the breaking of bread, which we will get to sometime sooner than I would like, or later than I would, uh, would hope, but it will come at a time when we can share the Eucharist together. Through our baptism, we're called to repent when we sin, we're called to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And these are the two that are really hard. We are called to strive for justice and peace in the world and to respect the dignity of every human being. We find ourselves in the midst of a time when these are especially hard to embrace to strive for justice and peace. At a time when we see justice as something that is fleeting, something that is beyond the grasp of a lot of people in our society. Uh, this fleeting sense of justice is something that we struggle to understand. On paper it sounds good, but in real life it is so hard to grasp. On Sunday we were talking about racism during our cathedral coffee hour. And I was reminded of what racism is really about by a story told by Denise Reistead, one of our parishioners. I grew up in Beloit, Wisconsin, which, if you don't know the history of Beloit, it's one of the few places in the state of Wisconsin that actually had a large African-American community. It had a large African-American middle-class community and I went to an integrated grade school in the 60s and the 70s and to me it seemed normative to have African-American friends. And so when I think about my experience as I go through life, I don't see myself as, as, as a racist. I don't see myself as being prejudiced towards people. But then Denise told us a story on Sunday about how as a reporter for Channel 4 she was driving a company car down the street, fully understanding that she always drove two miles under the speed limit and yet was pulled over by a policeman in Wauwatosa. And the policeman asked her, what are you doing here and why are you driving this car? Now the white cameraman sitting next to her in the passenger seat tried to explain, but it was going over the top of the cop's head. And that's what brought me once again to the realization that racism that we struggle with in our society is not the blatant racism of seeing a black person walking down the street and looking down on that person. As a white male, 
I'm not afraid to get pulled over by the cops at night. I might be ticked off because I'm going to have to pay a speeding ticket or some kind of violation, but I'm not afraid to be pulled over by the cops. If for some reason, for God knows why, I'm accused of a crime that I didn't do, as a white male, I have trust that the system will sort it out and that all will be well in the end. There are so many in this community for whom that's not true. There are so many in our community who are afraid of authority, who are afraid of the police, who are afraid of conflicts with people who are of different race. That, I think, when we talk about respecting the dignity of every person, is what our baptismal vow calls us to do. And not just in the blatant ways, not just in the ways that are so apparent, but the ways in our lives that sometimes we don't even think about. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. That is an equally hard task. When I look on the internet, when I see Facebook, I hear vitriol these days. I hear vitriol coming from people who think they're standing up for justice, who are crying out for justice, yet decry in vile terms people who they disagree with. I hear people on either side of the political spectrum vilifying people with whom they disagree. Our public discourse is poisonous. We can't get to the bottom of complicated situations by tossing out vitriolic, simple, quick sound bites to deal with the incredibly complicated situation that we find in our society. That's what loving our neighbor as ourself is all about. It's about setting aside our sense of self and then thinking about the other, thinking about the people we encounter, the thinking about their lives and, and what their experience with life is. That, I think, is what we're called to do in this day and age, to love our neighbor as ourself. So this week as we go out into the world, as we go out into a world that is still racked by the death of George Floyd, that is still racked by systematic racism and overt, overt racism, let's try to take a few minutes during our day to think about the other and understand that when we understand the other, that is how we strive for justice and peace in the world. And that is how we love our neighbor as ourself. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He was crucified and crucified, was crucified and died and buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and suspend us with your Holy Spirit. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous all for your love's sake. Amen. We continue to pray this week for our church. We pray for Stephen, our bishop, and for the staff at Nicholson House. We pray for all the parishes of this diocese as they minister in this time of pandemic and social unrest. We pray for our companion diocese of Nuala, who are now struggling with the COVID virus also. We pray for the people of our covenant partner, the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist, and for their rector, Bishop Jeff Haynes. We continue to pray for the staff and members and friends of this, our cathedral church. We continue to pray for all in civil authority, especially Donald, our president, Tony, our governor, the Congress of the United States and our state legislature. We continue to pray for all in our law enforcement community, especially for Nicole and for Jake. We ask that you give them patience and courage and a discerning spirit. We ask you to pray for all on our parish prayer list, especially for Bob and for Boris. We continue to pray for Judy and Marie. We continue to pray for all who suffer and are afflicted by this pandemic. We continue to pray for Lynn Miranda's sister. We continue to pray for all celebrating birthdays, life milestones this week, especially Matt Pamperin and, Ton, and Ton, Todd Heikinen, who celebrate their anniversary, and for Mary White, who celebrates her birthday. Let us pray. Oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in the bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth that in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make a common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, 
and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.
You gave them bread from heaven, alleluia, containing in itself all sweetness, alleluia. Let us pray. O God, who in this wonderful sacrifice has left us a perpetual memorial of your blessed passion, grant us, we pray, to, to so venerate the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may ever perceive within ourselves the fruit of your redemption, who lives and reigns world without end. Amen. Amen. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament. Blessed be God, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Blessed be God, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be the name of Mary, Jesus, our Virgin and Mother. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. 